All right, all right, all right. You are now rocking with the best, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for tuning in to another exciting, exhilarating episode of the Catch This Fade podcast. I am, of course, your host, KD Drummond. Find me on Twitter at KD Drummond NFL. That is my man, Five Grand, the one and only Mr. Patrick No C Walker. Find him on Twitter at Voice of the Star. Say what's up to the people, Pat. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our subscribers. We love you to death, whether you're on the $3 tier or the $10 friend of the program tier, uh, which gives you all the benefits, including video, pre-roll to the videos, et cetera, et cetera, access to all the content one day early. Doesn't matter which tier you're on, we love you to death. For those who are uh, new to the program or who have not subscribed just yet and you're seeing this free portion of the content, uh, just keep in mind, you're going to love this and enjoy it because Katie and I do what we do. Uh, but here in a few minutes, your freeness, new word, freeness, <laughs> your freeness is going to expire. So go ahead and subscribe while you can. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into what's coming for the Cowboys uh, in, in, by way of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Not going to be pretty, but we'll dive into that. But before we get to that, we got some uh, some punter news. Yeah, we got some punter news. Now, listen. Come here. Come close, people. What you got? What you got? <sighs> I have not been a fan of Chris Jones <laughs> for a very long time. I have it's besmirched, known. besmirched the man's reputation. It's known. I have faded Chris Jones on more than one occasion. In fact, most recently we talked about Chris Jones and everybody involved in the fact that Chris Jones is still on this team. From the coaching staff to the front office. Suspiciously <laughs> even. <laughs> this week, it was revealed that Chris Jones has been injured since 2018, 2019. Basically. For a long time. Basically. He suffered from a sports hernia that apparently has not gotten better, and they have not had any time on the injured list. They have not signed other punters. They have basically let this go. The egregious nature, <laughs> the unmitigated goal. There it is. <laughs> to let Chris Jones continue to punt and hurt this team in field position week after week after week and literally season after season. I can't begin to tell you how ridiculous it is that the Cowboys have failed to do anything better than this when it comes to this situation. Now, they signed a punter last week. Hunter Niswander from the XFL Go Google Hunter Niswander and check out his highlight tapes. Is it Niswander or Nicewander? Is it Nicewander? I, I, I wait until I somebody We'll, we'll double Niswander. check that. We'll, we'll wait until the broadcast. We'll, we'll wait until the broadcast. I'm just going to call him. Until, until then, I'm just going to call him Hunter. Hunter. Yeah. Hunter. You know how I'm about names. Let's let's put respect <laughs> on everybody. I understand, No, see, I completely understand. <laughs> there you, there you, you go. There you go. So Hunter. We got Hunter. Hunter. Yes. So Hunter has tremendous tape. He's actually a puncher and a field goal kicker. Right. But more, more importantly is his ability to kick for long distances, has great hang time, which is part and parcel with long distances. You can punt long, but it's a low kick, and they get it before the coverage can get down there. It's irrelevant. Right. It's not even so much about him, though. It's more about the fact that the Cowboys have paid Chris Jones an exorbitant amount of money to be a punter when punters are normally cheap. You can get great punters for cheap prices, and if you get one, fine, you sign him for a long term. But him being injured and being bad for three years is unacceptable when you could have easily, especially this year, more so than any year in the past, you could have had an alternative, but they chose not to. Now, remember what happens this year in the pandemic. They have the expanded roster. You can bring people up from the practice squad, two players up per week, Still elevate did. them, Still pay did. them, <laughs> pay them cheap. Mm -hmm. and then send them back to the practice squad, which they, I, which is what I was complaining about last week. They had Hunter signed to the practice squad, had an empty roster spot on the 53-man roster. And still. And still let Chris Jones run out there and punt 34-yard punts, which is now his regular. What are y'all doing? What are they doing, Pat? I, I have no idea, but what makes it even worse is, and, you know, to put some numbers on these, we're talking about uh, a punter who gets paid, who's going to hit the salary cap this season for two and a half million dollars. Number that's, 12. That, that's t number 12. 12th, 12th highest salary cap hit on the Dallas Cowboys. It's, is their it's punter. ridiculous. And now you look at, you add that number 
to the fact that, like you mentioned, he's having a hard time getting punts over 40 yards. This is something that the Cowboys could have resolved this offseason with the expanded rosters. This is something the Cowboys could have resolved in 2019 when they saw that he was dealing with these types of injuries and yet still had him going out there week in, week out. Uh, I couldn't explain why they continue to make decisions such as these because they're highly suspect. Now, you look at a guy like Hunter Niswander, Niswander will, will, you know, get his pronunciation here correctly after the – We will respect that man, yeah. We're going to put some respect (laughs) on his name. But you look at the young man, right? Uh, And I say young man because he's still in his 20s. He comes to the Cowboys as a – by way of the XFL. He was a three-year starter at Northwestern. uh, And he averaged just over, I believe, 43 yards a punt in his final season at Northwestern. He became a, one of the star, one of the bright spots in the XFL. He ended up averaging just under 45, I think it was 44.6 yards per punt. Um, he pinned the opponent uh, within inside of the 20-yard line, I think, eight times, uh, nine times, I want to say eight. So the, the kid has talent, or I should say the young man has talent. Uh, this is the type of move the Cowboys should have made long ago. But I liken this mistake – or at least the mistake of not inserting or creating or fostering a competition to that of Kai Forbath and Greg Zorline, the kicker competition that did not happen. Now, to Zorline's credit, for the most part, he's been doing well. He had his, his mistakes and his missteps, obviously, and he's been doing well. But now guess what you've just done? Now that we're talking about Zerline, you've put him in a situation where he might get Ray Finkled against the Steelers. Because uh, as much as Chris Jones was struggling, He was arguably, if not the best holder on the team. So you're not even giving, you know, as much as Hunter might come in and, you know, do what he does best, which we all hope he will. The fact that he's not been practicing for a long period of time, holding the ball, and we know how fickle kickers can be about their holders, how the ball is being held, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying that Hunter is going to go full laces in, but I am saying we don't know just yet what kind of holder he can be. And I don't think it's a situation where you want to move unless you have to, you want to move uh, the legendary LP, Le Desir. God, I love saying his name. It's not that you necessarily want to move him over to holder because his specialty is long snaps, right? Right. I think the the situation is with Jones because you didn't, or the additional situation, the additional issue is because you didn't make a move on Jones sooner. You've now put yourself in a position where you have a problem in two fashions. You have the problem of uh, hoping that the new kid can come in and and show you something, which would be great because you're only paying him, I think, $147,000, $148,000. It's it's not even couch money. It's something that you accidentally find when you're vacuuming out your kid's french fries from underneath your driver's seat. In football terms. In football terms. In football terms. In football terms. (laughs) Um, but we all know that salary cap terms. It's no we know that you're on the Biden tax break. We understand. No, no, no. Those who got the pre-roll know that you just recycled my joke. Those with the pre-roll, That's the friends of the program, it. know That's he just recycled it. my joke. So I'm gonna blow past that because those who know, you can tell these people around us, whoever you, whatever you want, but you, but you and I know, know what's going on. on. <laughs> but now they have a problem at they got to figure out if Hunter can come in and be a, a holder or if they're gonna have to put somebody else in it holder. But you're trying to figure all this out mid-season, and you could have been figuring this out in the off-season. Now, granted, you did not have a traditional off-season, but you did have a training camp, albeit yeah. truncated. I think the truncated training camp, for my part is more applicable and more yeah more applicable to um those who play skill positions those who are playing in the trenches kickers kick right all day long punters punt you do right right the whole practice (laughs) right so you're not going to tell me exactly you're not going to tell me and sell me on the fact that oh well you know we we didn't have these excuses that are being used and rightfully so when it comes to explaining uh, some of the accountability for why the defense is so bad, some of the accountability for why the offense can't operate without Dak, Dak Prescott. And, of course, the other reason is because it's not Dak Prescott. But this special team situation, I had a problem with them not competing for Bath versus Zorlon. Obviously, you agree. There, there was a, a huge divide between yeah. logic and the Cowboys' decision to not execute competition at the punter position, seeing Chris Jones – and his salary cap hit that was to come in 2019 and still saying, you know what? I know you were injured. You're still battling this. You didn't take steps to get it repaired surgically this off season, but we still feel really good about you in the, in this, you know, during the season. Last thing that here's the last thing I'll say, this, what, this is what makes it exponentially worse. 
your offense is now averaging nearly 26 points fewer per game in the absence of Dak Prescott. So what that means inherently is you're punting the ball more often. So you're punting the ball more often. You've not, not had Dak Prescott for what, three, four weeks now? Yep, three weeks. Three, three, three whole weeks. Week five, six, seven, eight, three whole weeks. Okay, so you've not had Dak, Pres- Dak Prescott for three whole weeks. It, there's so many, at so many points in this chronology, KD, could the Cowboys have made a better decision before right now? Yep. Even as, as far back as week six, when you saw that he was still struggling, he being Chris Jones, you saw he was still struggling with the sports hernia injury, the core muscle injury, and you knew your offense had fallen off a cliff, so you were going to need your punter that much more. So you, you pushed him that much more? What an egregious mistake by both Jason Garrett's regime in 2019 and now Mike McCarthy's regime. And that, that last point is what makes it, for me, fall on the front office and the fact that they gave him this contract. Now, in the grand scheme of contracts, Chris Jones isn't paid a lot. But again, yeah, it'll, he's it'll number 12. In the grand scheme. But for now, he's, he's number matters. 12. He's number 12 on the Cowboys uh, cap hits for 2020. He signed his contract back in 2017, and he actually had a very good year in 2017. His yards per return was just at 4.2, career best. So they got the reward for, for giving him the extension back in the year that they did it. But ever since then, it's been all downhill. He had, uh, according to PFF, Pro Football Focus, he had a grade of 81.0 in that first year of the contract. Since then, his grades have plummeted. He's down to 68.9 in 2018, 68.7 in 2019. This year, he's down to 60.7. That's how bad he is That's that Wiley Coyote drop off the cliff. Exactly. He he caught the anvil. You see the puff of smoke. You hear the puff of dust at the bottom when when Wiley hits the ground. He has he has basically hurt the Cowboys because one of the things that I've always taken away from the Bill Parcells regime is hidden yardage. When when he first mentioned hidden yardage and that extra phase of the game in a press conference, that was one of the things that kind of got me rolling in how to analyze football. We don't talk about it much, but the fact that you're not giving your defense long fields to defend if you don't punt well. Right. And basically the entire game of football is you want a short field on offense because it minimizes the amount of chances you have of making a mistake. Correct. Conversely, you want a long field on defense because the more snaps it takes to get downfield, the more likely the offense is going to make a mistake, a holding penalty, allow a sack, a turnover, those sorts of things. If your punter is routinely giving – the other team a short field to work with, whether that's because his punts don't travel far, they don't have the hang time, or they don't have the placement that prevents them from having nice returns. Because you can't just look at average punt distance. Right. You got, you, it's, it can it's be done levels. different ways. There are levels to this punting thing. You can punt it 45 yards, pin somebody to the sideline, and that's more effective than a 55-yard punt down the middle of the field. The Off average the is longer, but you've given up the opportunity for them to have a return. So all corner. those things come into play when you're looking at a puncher stats. And we all know, based on what we're seeing, Chris Jones has not been a net positive for the Cowboys over the last multiple years. So now they're in a situation where they're going to get somebody else in there, give them a chance to see whether or not they can do the job. And Chris Jones has just one final year remaining on his contract. So for all my... You got, you got, to, get from, you got to get from under this contract. You have to. He's, he's $2 million against your cap in base salary next year, $2.5 million total against your cap. The five million will be there no matter. I mean, the five hundred thousand will be right, there no that's matter dead. what. But that's you can dead. get out of that base salary of two million dollars. Right. Go to somebody that's just a uh, basically a bargain basement punter. If Hunter works out, it's him. Pay him six hundred seventy-five thousand dollars league minimum, whatever it is for next year. I think it's seven hundred ten thousand. Save that one point three million dollars and give it to Dak Prescott. Right. Because after all of this is said and done, we still have to figure out how to get money in order to pay Dak Prescott. On Tuesday, I wrote an article talking about Jalen Smith and how to escape out of his contract early. So go research escape Jalen Smith Cowboys wire if you want all of the details on it. But the long and the short, the Cowboys do have a window that if they chose to get rid of Jalen Smith, they could following the year. It would be a lot of dead money on a future cap, but you can finagle it so that it doesn't handcuff you in 2021 and it could free up $7.2 million that can go towards Dak Prescott's next contract. Now, the point that I made was basically this. And again, go read the article for all the details. 
if the Cowboys work out a long-term agreement with Dak Prescott between January, when they're allowed to start negotiating again, and then March, the beginning of the new league year, they don't need to move away from Jalen Smith. Whether or not they should move away from Jalen Smith, the player on the field is a different different conversation. conversation. Financially speaking now. But if you're not able to work out a deal with Dak Prescott and you need to franchise have him again, you don't have the cap space for it right now. Projecting after the Cowboys sign, they have 44 players under contract right now for 2021. They'll need to get to the offseason roster of 90, only the top 51 count. So if you basically say the minimum base salary for the next seven players to get to 51 players, the money that they have remaining from the 2020 cap that's going to roll over to 2021, the Cowboys have give or take around $20 million to work with once they get to the new league here. Dak's franchise tag is $36.9 million. For those of you doing math at home, that's $16.9 million that they're going to have to come up with some way mm-hmm. in order to franchise tag Dak Prescott. Right. So when you're looking at things that can happen, Chris Jones, $1.3 million, get it off the books. Right. Save that money. $2 million, right. replace him with another player. Right. $1.3 million net. Get him off the books. Jalen Smith sitting there at $7.2 million to be looking like a, a dog in traffic that's chasing a laser pointer all around the field. <laughs> What's the point? I'm not saying that Jalen Smith is bad. I'm not saying that he can't be we're, salvaged. We're, at this moment, we're strictly talking financials. Exactly. If you're looking for cutting bait with players who have not lived up to their contract, out of all of the big money contracts, there's one on defense and one on offense. Let me, let me paraphrase that because I said about not living up to the contract. So specifically not living up to the contract, I would say that Jalen Smith is there. I would also say cut Jerome Crawford for the rest of the season and save whatever $4 million you can on the cap, roll that over. That right. would be a no-brainer to me. But on offense, a player that has a deductible contract that you probably could look at, the only one that you could look at probably saving money from would be Amari Cooper. I don't want to see Amari Cooper go. I think that would be a detriment to everything that the Cowboys have built on offense and would want to have once you return Dak Prescott for the next several years. But Amari Cooper's contract is the only one set up in a way that you can escape it if you're hunting for money. So I just want to kind of say be on the lookout for these things. Once we get to the offseason, and everybody knows if you've been watching the show for the last several weeks, I'm in offseason mode. I'm in Tahiti. I'm Agent Colson. I'm in Tahiti right now, bro. Yeah, you, so, you're sipping my ties. Listen, I'm already <laughs> on that. <laughs> you're sipping my ties. But there is still some focus on what's going on on the field. So let's talk about what's coming up for this game. Pat, do we have any news on a guy that we thought could be traded or I thought could be traded if he had been healthy? But he never got healthy in time for the trade deadline. That might have been smart by him. He might have been like, I don't want to go to cold weather. He might he might have been milking it. I'm just playing. I don't know if he's milking it or not. But talk to me about Cheeto and whether or not we're going to get to see him against Pittsburgh. Well, for, as far as Chidobe Awuzie goes, he's been battling this hamstring injury since the beginning of the season. Uh, obviously a severe one. Um, you know, I, I saw someone compare it to Miles Austin. Uh, and all jokes aside, that's a fair, fair uh, comp okay. right there. Uh, now, he's close, but the Cowboys, after early last week, laying out the expectation that he would return uh, against the Eagles along with Zach Martin from Martin's concussion that cost him one game. Uh, over the course of practice, Mike McCarthy and his staff, they just did not like um, what they saw. Now, that's not to say that he's far off from returning, but they feel like another week uh, at least would be good for him they're not really going to look to make a decision on Joby Wouzier. Um, I, I doubt, after having some conversations with some folks, I doubt they're going to make a definitive determination on Friday when that final injury report comes out. Okay. I think they're, they're going to label him as questionable, maybe doubtful, um, but they're looking for Saturday to have him run through that Saturday practice so they can get one last look and see, hey, you know what, should we go, is he ready to go ahead and play now or should we just hold back, which is another option? And it could be the wiser option of the two, um, all things considered. Are we going to look at holding him back out of this week as well? Because we have a bye week coming up. Now, in the grand scheme of things, the Cowboys are 2-6. and six. We'll get to the Pittsburgh preview in a moment. Um, but for all intents and purposes, let's assume they're going to be 2-7. and seven. Should it be a woozie, you know, missing the next two weeks is not going to make or break this season. But if you're a woozie, 
um, you have to be cautious about coming back early because you've already lo basically lost half the season because of injury and it's a contract year. So when you come back, you better make sure that you're coming back a hundred percent because the remainder of the games, you have to put fantastic film in the universe yeah. because not only are the Cowboys watching, 31 other teams are watching as well. So you have, uh, depending on when he gets back, you have six or seven more games, assuming he misses this one. You have six or seven games only to, to put that dart in the bullseye. Now, at this point, nobody expects Chidobe Awuze to break any kind of bank as a free agent, but he can at least drive his value a bit higher than what it has become because it's, it's basically devalued over the past couple oh, yeah. of years. Yeah. Um, so as it stands, Cowboys are still evaluating. Uh, they're not going to rush him back out there. And I don't think if, if you're Chidobe Awuze, you have to be smart and you have to not rush back out there either. If you need this additional week off, this additional week off turns into two weeks off. So at that point, because you were close to returning in week eight, there should be no reason you're not back for week 11. And then you can really start trying your best to put out some great film, especially now that we're seeing Trevon Diggs really come into his own. So now you have that true or truer, I should say, number one over over um, some of the struggles that Trevon Diggs had over the course right. of the season until now. But that could help Chidobe Awuzie out as well. I don't think they're going to rule him out. Uh, if they're going to rule him out, I don't think you'll see that Friday. I think he'll be either a game-time decision or you'll get a decision on him on Saturday. Yeah, I, I want to put a pin in the reference that you just made to Trevon Diggs, uh, and we'll come back to that in yeah, just we'll a come couple back seconds. That. But <clears throat> you hit the nail on the head. The evaluation of Chidobe Awuzie is now all that matters. And for both sides, for, for both him and for Mike McCarthy. Before Trevon Diggs, two interceptions in the game against Philadelphia, tremendous interceptions. The only what, player... What, who, who did it again? Trevon Diggs. Who, what did who, I say? who was it? Who was it? What did I say? Trevon Diggs. No, you're right. I just wanted to hear it again because... Okay, all right. <laughs> because I was full. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Um... Awuzie was the only player that had an interception, the only uh, secondary player that had an interception for the Cowboys up to that point. Um, he got it early, then he injured his hamstring. So Mike McCarthy and staff, Mike Nolan. <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> My God. Have to figure out, have to figure out now oh, what their cornerback rotation is going to be because at the beginning of the year it was going to be Awuzie and Brown on the outside. They were going to let Diggs fit in where he fit in. But you can't take Diggs off the field now. No, 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 no. no You're not no, taking Diggs no. off the field. He's going to no, get a full complement no, of snaps every game. No. 68, 100% snaps. That that would be that would be a complete tank move. Right. Like that, you, that, could, that. you couldn't you couldn't then argue that you're not trying to tank. Like that's so tank. so <laughs> the player that they decided to sign in the offseason when they let Byron Jones go and they gave fifteen million dollars over three years with Anthony Brown. So it's going to be interesting to see how they deploy. There are players. Anthony Brown can play both slot and uh, the boundary. And the outside, yep. But they primarily used him as a boundary corner so far this year. There was some time that he spent some time in the slot, but primarily, and half of that had to do with injury. So, you know, we'll see what happens when they have a full complement of guys to roll out there. But they primarily used him as a boundary player. So the question will be, how many snaps does Awuzie get? We know that based on Randy Gregory and Sean Lee, they play the slow game. You come back your first game, you yep. get four to ten snaps. All right, you get That's to it. sniff. You get to sniff it a little bit. Right, you get to sniff it, and then if you are able to survive, and especially with a player with a hamstring injury when you're a cornerback, mm. so yeah. I anticipate that even if he gets the extra week with a bye, when he comes back, he's only going to get a handful of snaps to start off with. But moving on from week 12 through week 17, those final six weeks of the season, is really going to be a test to see where Owusu is because the Cowboys have to find a corner opposite Trevon Diggs. It's not going to be Anthony Brown. Anthony Brown is going to be a Swiss Army knife. He's going to be a guy that he can start if you need him to be. When you go three corners, when you go into the dime package, Anthony Brown can play. But he is not – let me rephrase that. As Trevon Diggs currently stands, Anthony Brown is not quality enough to be the guy opposite him. If Diggs elevates himself to being a shutdown corner, mm -hmm. then Anthony Brown could be the guy that's opposite him. But that's even further into the conversation. The Cowboys have to figure out what they want to do opposite Trevon Diggs moving forward. And the Wouzier's return is going to play a very big role in that because he's a free agent. Jordan Lewis is a free agent. Jordan Lewis is as good as gone. 
I, I would be sh- unless he signs. But see, but see, okay, and and not to interject, but to interject. No, interject, please. Interject. Th- this is this is where to answer your question. This is how I would handle it. Okay. Okay. It it feels like Jordan Lewis and the Cowboys are going to part ways. We don't know just yet. That's not sourced information. That's just feeling right now. And so hopefully it changes. Huge fan of Jordan Lewis, as you know. Hope he can figure out a way to stay with the Cowboys and and, or they can figure out a way to convince him to stay with the Cowboys. I hope he can figure out a way to cover. Sorry. What I Okay, so to that point that I don't wholly agree with, but he has struggled, fair enough. What I would do, because we're talking about now, Shelby Wuzier potentially, uh, if he misses this this game, uh, I believe it'll be because it's in his best interest for both parties to make sure he's 100% when he returns, and that's more likely in week 11 than week nine. Um, especially, <laughs> are you really going to throw him out there against uh, Chase Claypool, which we'll get to later? Think about that. Um, put a pin in that. We'll come back to that. What I would do is, obviously, you're not going to sit down Trevon Diggs. The rookie is starting to truly come into his own. Two interceptions against the Eagles. Uh, Just fantastic uh, performance overall. And like you mentioned in uh, Monday's episode, which was Tuesday, for those of the uh, the $3 subscription tier, um, you brought up an excellent point in that Trevon Diggs was so elite in that game that his mistakes in allowing six catches, 76 yards, a couple touchdowns, were so overshadowed by everything else he did right that he landed the highest grade or one of the two highest rookie grades by PFF uh, from last week's game. So he's coming into his own. Uh, but I would keep uh, Trevon Diggs, obviously, in the number one slot. I would put Chidobe Awuzie opposite him. I would scale back the reps on Anthony Brown and keep Jordan Lewis in the nickel, and here's why. Anthony Brown, as you mentioned, has already signed his extension. You've seen what you need. If you're the Cowboys, you've seen what you need to see from Anthony Brown. But the remainder of this season has to be about assessing not only your young guys, but the guys in contract years so that you can determine if, hey, am I going to pay this guy? And if so, what are the numbers going to look like? As much as Shinobi Awuzie is one of those guys, as is Jordan Lewis. So I would look Jordan Lewis in the eyes and say, you know what, you know, Woozy is back. We need to assess both of you guys over the next seven or eight games so that we can figure out a valuation scale for 2021. Then you look at Anthony Brown and say, hey, you know what? This is not a personal knock to you. This is not saying you're not playing well because he actually is playing well. This is saying two things. Number one, we need to assess them. You already got your deal. Uh, we'll see you in 2021 for the reboot. OK, yep. but also Anthony Brown has battled injury this season as well. Why risk? additional injury to Anthony Brown when you, in fact, could be assessing the future of Jordan Lewis and Shadobi Awuzie. So for my money, that's how I would play it to answer that question. It's it's easily done. You just just do it. I, I, I can dig that. And we're going to talk about once we get uh, over to the, the pay portion of the show, we're going to talk about that evaluation um, and spinning it forward for the 2021 season. But all of this conversation that we've had, we've danced around the fact that the Cowboys have a number one corner, bruh. Mm. The Cowboys, um, I'm sorry, I can't say the New Orleans number one corner without worrying about why did they let Byron Jones go? Because they could have been, they could have been what Miami right now is shutting down ones, everybody. Right. They could have had Howard two and number Byron ones, Jones, two number ones, just like you got three number one receivers. Could have had two number one corners, but hey, you, know, you 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 want to be cheap about it? It's ridiculous. It's that's just what? ridiculous. I, I'll never. I, I said it on I'll Twitter. Never I'll them. never let them get over it. Ever. I'll never. For those that are saying Ever. that will come out and say two years from now, I'll bring it up and people will say we'll move on. Nope, ain't moving on. The same <laughs> because, way because we oh. know what yes. it could have been, and we know where they could have gotten the money from. That's even worse. If if we were if we were mm-hmm. ignorant to the yeah. salary cap and we didn't know, oh yeah, they couldn't afford to pay Byron Jones sixty million dollars a year. No. They're paying they Jerome Crawford have. $8 million a right. year. They're paying they uh, Jalen Smith and $7 million on the cap. It, we, we know where the money could have paid. Those who know, know. Right. Those who don't know and don't hey, care to know. Put, put the push of T on. If you know, right. you know. If, if you know, you know, you know. But that does not change the fact that we have a guy named Travon Diggs. We need to give him a fake middle name. Travon Bartholomew Diggs. Mm, like it. I like it. Like it. Do the Bartman. Do the Bartman. I just that showed my dude is, <laughs> What he did in that game against Carson Wentz and poo-poo Carson Wentz and his struggles this year all you want to. 
Diggs' two interceptions were incredible plays. Athleticism. And it was <laughs> out, out the yin yang. I mean, it was just he 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 was the diving catch in the end zone, going out of bounds, getting the leg down, and up, keeping the ball and in position the, through the process. And when he went over the shoulder, Willie Mays mm-hmm. to catch the ball when he ran the route better than the receiver in the wind of Lincoln Financial Field mm-hmm. and all of the stuff that they were talking about on the broadcast. He played that, and he exemplified everything that you thought you were going to get when you talked about Trevon Diggs being a steal in the second round and then being able to get him. When who talked about it? You, Pat. Oh, okay. Just checking. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll give you, Go ahead. I will give you your props on Diggs. Oh no, that's that's not necessarily for you, but for yeah, those that would you know just jumping onto the to the wagon and they want to you know I, I should start up a no 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 every single time I've been on this since more I I will, I will be the coach every single time I will walk up to the tee and place the ball on the tee <laughs> yeah, and, I, when and, it I'm comes, gonna, and I'm when Tiger it comes Woods to the hell out of it <laughs> I'm, I'm will, that that thing going four fifty off the tee listen. <laughs> What the Cowboys have in him, and again, we talked about the pro football focus grade, despite the fact that he gave up two touchdowns and six catches, he was a 91, I think 91.3 grade on the week, 91.3 and 91.6, whatever it was. Coverage grade was absolutely incredible. That means that he has finally broken through. Week after week, we had talked about the roller coaster that he was on. So close to making a big play, giving up too many bad plays, all of the rookie mistakes, all of those sorts of things. But what he can build on now that he finally got that game under his belt is going to be incredible. I'm not saying that every game from here on out is going to be all, you know, roses and sunshine and rainbows. He'll still have his valleys. He's he's still going to have his struggles in a game. He'll still have his valleys. Yeah. But he will now, he now has the, the game that you can always anchor to. Right. You can always say, I know this is what my ceiling is, or I know this is what my current high point is imagine what my ceiling could be based on this performance. So kudos to him. I'm very excited about what that means in this dark, abysmal season of Mike Nolan defense. <laughs> Trevon Diggs is a shining light. But look, and, and here's what's even more beautiful about it. Um, back in early spring, when I mocked Trevon Diggs to the Cowboys, and I mocked him here as a first round pick, right? I'm 450 off the tee. <laughs> 450 off the tee. <laughs> <laughs> that ball is going to explode in mid-flight. <laughs> so when I when I mocked him here as a, as a first round pick and, and caught a, a lot of heat for it, no, you know he's not the guy. Uh, you know, have you seen his film? Absolutely, I've seen his film. And not only have I seen his film, uh, at those who follow the program, those who uh, know Katie and myself from following on Twitter, they know with my dogs, I am an SEC guy. Diggs being from Alabama, a direct rival. I've seen tons of Diggs films. I, I know what his um, opportunities for improvement are, but I also know what his talents are. And I said it then, and I've said it a hundred times before now, and I'm going to say it again. Athleticism and ability to play the ball like a wide receiver. Why? Because he used to be a wide receiver. So when you look at that second interception, well, first of all, the first interception was indicative of his receiver skills. Right, okay. Yeah. But then when you look at the second interception over the shoulder, if you, if you pause, if you freeze frame that and you switch jerseys via Photoshop, you can't tell me who's the receiver and who's the defensive back. Those are the types of plays and the type of talent that the Cowboys saw when they put a first round grade on him. And the only player outside of CeeDee Lamb falling to 17, which nobody saw happening, the only player that they would have taken over Diggs was Kalevon Chase. Right. Now, Diggs comes in, and if you go back, if you look at the film uh, in each of the first eight games, you're going to see peaks and valleys. And in those peaks, or at least closer to the peaks, I should say, to my tally, feel free to disprove this, but I have Trevon Diggs as potentially having four or five interceptions already this season had he been able to reel in the previous ones. So that because there were at least two or three that, albeit difficult at times, they hit his hands, and you're like, ah, Diggs, you got to come up with that. But the beauty of this game, like you said, it's an anchor game, and because it happened – You would have loved for it to happen sooner, but the season's not over. It's midpoint through the season. Now he knows how it feels to get an interception at the NFL level 
And the fact that he doubled up in the game, I don't want to hear that crap about, oh, where is, well, it's Carson Wentz. Here's what bothers me about it. I'm going to say this in, in KD Drummond's voice. Miss me with all that. Miss me with that. Don't be an amoeba brain. All right. Be more than a single celled organism when it comes to your train of thought. Yes. KD, there are people who have been begging the Cowboys to get takeaways, pleading. And you and I are two of those people. They go and get a ball hawk. He happens to be a rookie, which means, number one, he's going to have the rookie learning curve. That's why he has more values than peaks. But you've all you've seen the promise before he broke out in week eight. You drop him into a situation where there's no Myron Jones and also a questionable safety unit. Xavier Woods is, is taking a step back in the contract year. You had Darian Thompson back there before you inserted Donovan Wilson, who you and I are both huge fans of. Your pass rush was completely inconsistent on a game-to-game basis. You lose should be a Wuzier who wasn't playing great before, but now if he's not on the field, that makes it that much worse. Jalen Smith running around, like you said, chasing a laser in traffic. All right, squirrel. <laughs> Trevon Diggs is, is – so he was doing too much. This is something that I've said before in the analysis of Trevon Diggs uh, this season. Doing too much. Eyes in the backfield. What's the running back doing? What's the quarterback doing? Should I cheat forward and help my defensive front? And that was the card no sin from a defensive back standpoint. Do your job. Katie, you've heard me say this now several times over the past few episodes. Do your job. If you're defensive seven – Screw up the play. That's not your problem until that ball carrier is right in front of you. And then you can cap it at a 15 yard gain, 17 yard gain. But that's better than giving up the big play, the deep play over the head, which is what we've seen. Almost gave it up to DK Metcalf, almost gave it up to Julio Jones, who dropped the ball, did give it up uh, to players like Odell Beckham Jr., et cetera, et cetera, which also goes to a point this gauntlet that Trevon Diggs has gone up against yeah, to begin his murderous season. Murderous row, murderous row. Keep, keep everything we're saying, folks, in mind when we're talking about Trevon Diggs' uh, challenges. And now I'm going to give you some of the names that he's going up against. He's going up against your guy, Terry McLaurin. <laughs> he's going up against Julio Jones. He's going up against uh, DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett because he had multiple assignments on both. He's going up against Odell Beckham Jr. Uh, He's going up against Darius Slayton, right? The list goes on and on. This is, like you said, it's a murderer's row. And he was simply trying to do too much. He was overthinking. He's a rookie. His defense around him, for the most part, sucked. He's trying to figure out what Mike Nolan wants of him, so forth and so on. What does Al Harris want of him, so forth and so on. So much to compute, so much to figure out. And you mean to tell me, in all likelihood, And again, we're not saying that he's going to have a multiple interception game or even a single interception game every single game. But you mean to tell me through all of that shit, through all of that, he's figured it out at week eight? Yep. Trevon Diggs, stud. Yeah. Stud. Didn't take long to figure it out. Uh, if you were not on the hive and not on the wagon that I tried to put everybody on back in March. But now you're seeing why he was a first round grade. Now you're seeing why, given a, another few games, when I say few, I could be talking about another 16 games. Okay. But I believe by mid to late 2021, we are literally talking about Stefan Gilmore type play. If, 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 the Cowboys show me George Edwards. Show me George Edwards. Because I, 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 I do believe that the continuation, if they continue with Mike Nolan next season, and I, on one end I get why they would because he gets to say, hey, look at everything that I had to go through. Right. I should be get a mulligan. And, bro. You had a 30-year mulligan, yeah, bro. Yeah, get, get out, out of here. here. Get, get out, out of here. here. There's a reason you haven't coordinated any coordinate. Coordinate. Anything no since 2014. No yeah, there's a reason no you haven't coordinated rain. anything since 2014. So we're, we're not hearing yeah. that. Show me George Edwards. I've seen what George Edwards can do with defensive backs. Um, and I think George Edwards plus an Al Harris plus the aptitude both mentally and physically of Trevon Diggs, I think by the end of 2021, you're talking about one of the best corners in the NFL. I am actually, I would love to see what George Edwards can do. 
I am not married to him being the choice to follow up on Mike Nolan. Now, I understand the whole continuity aspect when mm-hmm. you're talking about how Trayvon Diggs can benefit from making sure that at least he has a similar voice or a familiar voice. I was voice about to say, don't, don't reset ear. again for the re- I, I, it, second year at that point. But two resets, I mean, in two years. What, what I, under, I understand. I understand. <laughs> but Mike Nolan, Mike Nolan is so detrimental to the emotional health and the mental well-being. Dude, you could put a ham sandwich. Just let a ham sandwich coordinated. If, if, I don't you know. listen. <laughs> we have to. We there. There's so much that can come into play with how staffs are restructured in the off season. I'm just not married to anybody that's currently on staff of what is going to be the worst defense because we don't know how much. Maybe George Edwards has a bigger voice than we know in the meeting rooms. Mike Nolan is calling the plays and all that, but maybe George Edwards has been contributing for the last several weeks since they've talked about simplifying, and we just don't know. He's a senior defensive assistant, so he has been contributing. Right, so that's what I'm saying. So if he can't overcome the atrocity that is Mike Nolan based on his influence, then I'm not sure that there isn't a better option out there. I'm not saying that I know a better option. that's That's not unfair. That's not unfair, but I will counter with this. There is a, a, a major difference between being the driver of the car oh, yeah. and sure. being the GPS. Yes, for because sure. the for GPS, sure. George Edwards could very well, as a senior defensive assistant, he could very well be inserting input and saying, you know, in a tenth of a mile turn left, and Nolan is like, did you say right? <laughs> and then he's like, you know, uh, George Edwards could say at the next fork in the road, take it right. And he's like, yeah, but I'm feeling left. So you make a valid point for those that are wondering. Yes, absolutely. George Edwards has some sort of input when yeah. it comes to the defensive scheme on a weekly basis. That's why he's on staff. But until you show until you put his hands on the wheel, I don't know what he can or can't do in Dallas with this personnel set. But I do know what he did. Under Zimmer, in under Minnesota. Zimmer, though. right? But fair, under Zimmer, that's fair. what I'm saying. Okay, are we going to act like? Let me let me let me phrase this correctly because I don't want to take away from from Zimmer's overall greatness uh, as a coach, uh, in particular as a defensive coach. But we've seen Zimmer struggle defensively this season as well. So it could they, be he, they sold all the players. They they sold all of Minnesota's players. Every single one they sold them. So when they, went, when they went and got Ngakwe, what happened there? Huh? Exactly. <laughs> moving on. Moving they on. They sold his corners. Mo- moving on. They sold right. all now, his granted, he lost, granted, he lost to Neil Hunter. But you go and, and they get, sold his co- – and, and Everson Griffin, and they sold his corners. They didn't so, sell Everson Griffin. They just – that just didn't come back to, to fruition. But I, I get your overall point, thanks. right? But, but I will also offer that they went and got Ngakwe and – a few weeks later, they end up trading them, taking a loss to move. That. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. Just, oh, my God, that was such an <laughs> F as a, as, a, as a move. But anyway, Zimmer, overall, one of the better defensive-minded coaches in the NFL. Nothing to take away there. But we've seen him struggle, not just this season. We've seen him struggle in, in seasons past. Um, uh, I wonder how much of the success – in the in the Zimmer Edwards era was attributable to Zimmer. How much was attributable to Edwards? I'm I'm going to just be fair and and cut it 50 50 since we don't definitively know. That said, even if Edwards was 50 percent accountable for the Vikings almost perennially having a top 10 defense at times, having uh, <laughs> one that was ranked in the top five on one occasion, had one ranked number one, if he's even 50% accountable for that, and also he brings every teaching that Mike Zimmer imparted on him, onto him, I want to see what happens when you put him with this personnel set. I want to see it. Enough with the Nolan shenanigans, enough with the hybrid defense. It sounds great in theory, but if you don't have the players that can execute it, and I'm not saying scheme over players, that's not what I'm saying. I am forever talent over scheme, but to attempt to throw away one of those things in this equation is both disingenuous and it's not how football is played. At a certain point, you can be talent all day long, but you got to have a construct. 
on the other side, you could have a construct all day long, but if you're not taking the best talent, then you can't perform. At, at, yeah, right. If you're, te- yeah. if you're taco charlting this thing, <laughs> then you're going to take an L. So that's, that's my stance on George Edwards. I'm not saying he's the savior. You and I can agree Nolan is not, but Edwards provides continuity going into 2021. He, uh, also has the familiar, familiarity with Mike McCarthy. I just feel like if they're going to make a change at defensive coordinator, which I think they should, George Edwards is the most likely candidate. That's all I'm saying. The smart thing would be to fire Mike Nolan right now, let George Edwards take over for the rest of the oh. season and evaluate him over the last eight games. That would Low be clap. the smart thing to do. Low but clap. that would – but – that would require the person who thought it was a smart idea to hire Mike Nolan in the To admit place. that they made a mistake. There you go. Which goes back to the previous couple of episodes when I said this Nolan situation is, is one of McCarthy's fault? biggest tests. It, it, it are, are you going to are you going to Garrett Linehan this thing? We'll have to see. You know. <laughs> For those of you who have been tuning in on the free episode, we appreciate you. We love you guys to death. And we gave you a lot more than we we gave said you we way, would give. We way, gave you a ton. way too much more, but that's because we're we're you know generous. We're people. nice guys. We're, we are. So that's we're why nice you should guys. definitely re- return Halo. the favor. Go to patreoncom slash catch this fade. Halo. patreoncom slash catch this fade. I'm ignoring that trash. <laughs> Halo. Right Halo. Halo. Patreon. Beyonce style. Halo. Don't you see my Halo? <laughs> patreoncom slash catch this fade. Please ignore the brain. Katie, let me take this opportunity to apologize to no one. There you need is. to apologize to yourself for that for is. that outfit. That's what there you need to is. apologize hey, for. Hey, listen, listen, listen. Don't don't hate my drip. Not everybody can be fired up. Don't hate my don't hate my drip. Don't hate my drip. Curly W. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you for tuning in. We are going to be right back for those of you who are on the three dollar or the ten dollar tier on patreoncom slash catch this fade. We have so much more to go over. We're going to be talking about uh, the Cowboys quarterback decision of who's going to be playing Sunday against Pittsburgh. We're going to do a Pittsburgh skill preview for whatever that's worth. Uh, Talk about some things that we're doing it. So it's worth a lot. KD Drummond. I'm I'm talking about the prospects for the game. Mm. Prospects for the actual Cowboys. You tried it, my brother. All right, let's go. (laughs) We'll be right back after this break.